Hi folks, this is our last mini lecture for chemistry. And it's all about the special properties of water. I said um, at the end of the last lecture that my favorite molecule, water, um, is really strange. And it, that's sometimes hard to remember uh, because we're so used to it being around. Um, it's, it's everywhere on our planet. Um, but in fact, based on its chemical formula, um, it does a lot of really strange things. So why do we care about water? Again, we are primarily made of water. Um, water is a critical ingredient in the reactions that build up and break down macromolecules. It's a critical reactant in accessing the energy from our food as well. So what is it about water that makes it so weird, which is, in fact, why it's so critical? Well, the answer lies where it usually does, which is in the structure. So last lecture I talked about water is a polar molecule. You have two polar oxygen-hydrogen covalent bonds within each water molecule, and that leads to the presence of weak intermolecular attractions called hydrogen bonds between water molecules. That hydrogen bonding is why water is different than we would expect it to be based on its chemical formula. So water is liquid at room temperature. Okay, Cindy, duh. Well, duh, but not duh. It turns out that Right. Usually things that are heavier are more likely to be a solid than a liquid. Not always, but... So if I have hydrogen sulfide, which is H2S, right, and I have H2O, everything else that I... I'm pretty sure this is the case, but I'm going to say it anyway. Where you have a column six element, so six valence electrons, sharing two valence electrons with two different hydrogens. Those things are all gases, but they're all heavier. So they really, the fact that water is not a gas at room temperature and pressure is, that's strange. The temperature of liquid water goes up and down very, very slowly, something that's referred to as specific heat. So it has a high specific heat. Um, one way to convince yourself of that is think about um, if you go to the beach at the summer, you go to the pool at the summer, right? Everybody's, when it's really, the sun's shining down on the sand or the pool deck, everybody is running really fast to get their feet in the water because their feet are burning. Well. The reason that the water isn't as hot as the sand is that it takes more heat energy to heat water than it does to heat sand. Water has a high heat of vaporization. That means it takes a lot more energy to take water from being a liquid to a gas than you would expect it to. Water as a solid, which is what ice is, um, is actually less dense than it is when <clears throat> it's a liquid, right? If, if you think about density, right? Density is, I always describe it as how much stuff you have in a given amount of space, right? So if I have got the same amount of space 
in these two boxes, which I'm going to end up not being able to draw so that they look the same, but you get my picture. I'll pretend they're the same size. And one has a lot more, um, you can fit a lot more molecules in that space. It's more dense. And remember, the difference between solids and liquids and gases is how far apart the molecules are. Or the, the, the um, if you have a, an element, the atoms in the element are. So normally, solids are more dense than liquids, but not in water. Water is also what is referred to as cohesive. It sticks to itself. It also sticks to other things, like spider webs, like plant leaves, like um, your hair when you walk through uh, a misty morning. Water is sticky because it has partial charge. It sticks to itself. When we say, right, water forms droplets on most surfaces. If you have the same size droplet of a nonpolar molecule, it's going to do that. It flattens out. It doesn't stick to itself. So what this tells us, believe it or not, is that the force of electrostatic attraction in liquid water is stronger than the force of gravity. Boom, take that gravity. Water is also a solvent, meaning you can dissolve charged particles, think ions, which are often referred to when they're in the human body as electrolytes. Any ion, any polar molecule is at least partially dissolvable in water because water is polar. I could go on for a super long time, ask my partner or my children about how wonderful and weird water is, um, but I won't. Bottom line, all of these crazy, unexpected, from a chemical point of view, properties of water are a function of the fact that it's made of two polar covalent bonds and hydrogen bonding happens between water molecules. In order for water to go from being a liquid to a gas completely, you have to add enough energy to break all of the hydrogen bonds that have formed. That's a lot of energy. Um, all right, enough about that. On to pH. All right, pH, which, um, as you probably know, has to do with acids and bases or alkalis. Um, now, water molecules, covalent bonds are strong, right? But... Anything that can happen does happen a tiny percentage of the time. So sometimes, particularly, well, in liquid water, water molecules are constantly bumping into each other. And every so often, they will dissociate or break up partially. And when they do that, what happens is, so here's, right, we've got oxygen, here, and these are our hydrogens. When that happens um, in liquid water, oxygen is really electron hungry. And it's really what we call electronegative. It hangs on, hangs on to the electron that, I don't want to say rightfully belongs to this hydrogen over here, but um, it was attached to it at one point. And so we have now what's called a hydroxide ion, right? Because we have one more electron than proton associated with this OH group. And we've got a hydrogen ion left. 
Now this only happens for not even a microsecond, and then another molecule is gonna bump into it, and it'll or another hydroxide ion will bump into a hydrogen ion again, and boom, you've got water. Um, but it it happens often enough um, that we end up. Um, having hydroxide and hydrogen ions. All right. So as you can imagine, right, if you have a sample of water that's been distilled, which means that everything has been, all of the minerals and anything else other than water molecules have been removed from it, um, you're going to have, when water dissociates, breaks up, you're going to have an equal number of hydroxide and hydrogen ions. Um, and that's neutral as far as pH goes. So if having an equal number of hydrogen and hydroxide ions is what being neutral means, what's an acid? Acids are any substances that when they break apart release hydrogen ions or can take up the hydroxide ions. So something like hydrochloric acid, which is HCl, when you put HCl in water, you end up with hydrogen ions and chloride ions for brief periods. So it's an acid. Something that will reduce the number of hydroxide ions is going to have a similar effect in terms of the um, making something acidic. Bases or alkaline substances are things that either soak up hydrogen ions or that increase hydroxide ions. So, for example, if I have sodium hydroxide, which is NaOH, that's sodium, oxygen, hydrogen. When this dissociates, when you put it in water, you end up with positive sodium and a hydroxide ion. So the pH scale is a numerical way of relating the concentration of hydrogen ions um, in a substance. And we use it to determine if something, is, the number to help us determine if something is an acid or a base, an alkali. Um, this, this scale is a reverse log scale, um, and that explains that something a little counterintuitive about pH, and that is that the lower the number is, the more acidic it is, and the higher the concentration of hydrogen ions. The higher the number is, the more basic or alkaline the substance is, and the lower the concentration of hydrogen ions is. Think of pH as meaning the power of hydrogen. So 7.0 is perfectly neutral, right? So if you have distilled water you and it dissociates, you're going to have exactly equivalent amounts. This is a log scale, so a difference, the difference between 7 and 8 is actually a difference of a hundredfold rather than 1. Okay, so a couple things to take away from this image. The first is <clears throat> that um, there is a wide range of things that we can safely put into our body that there's a wide pH range, right? We tend to um, do better with things that are, are slightly acidic. A really strong base is as dangerous 
as a really strong asset, right? And that's why um, oven cleaner and ammonia and household bleach are uh, danger can be dangerous substances um, because they have a very high pH. Again, neutral is 7.0. 6.9 is slightly acidic. 7.1 is slightly basic. Our bodies are not neutral. Not by a long shot. In fact, different parts of our bodies have different pH levels. Um, and we'll talk about that a lot more as we get go through the course, particularly with the digestive system. But many of the tissues in our body, the pH is 7.4. And the pH of blood is extraordinarily tightly controlled, around 7.4. You can see there's a very wide range of pH that's healthy. Um, for urine. And if you think about it for a second, that might lead you to ask, well, does that mean the urinary system is part of the body's way of controlling pH? The answer is yes, it is. Okay. Um, one of the things in the lab, the virtual lab you're going to work on this week is... Um, a inter, uh, little interactive looking at the effect of pH on uh, enzyme activity. And enzymes are proteins that are, are um, really important for making our chemical reactions work in the body. Okay, so sort of check for understanding which substance contains the highest concentration of hydrogen ions. Well, I wouldn't expect you to know the pH of any substance other than blood, which is 7.4, or distilled water, which is 7.0. should put the point zero there. So you use the number. Remember, the lower the number, the higher the concentration of hydrogen ions. So correct answer is coffee because it has the lowest pH value, right? If the question was which of these substances has the highest concentration of hydroxide ions, it would be bleach because that's got the highest pH value. All right, so in order to change pH, so say I have an acid and I want to raise the pH to neutral. Well, to do that, I'm going to need to add a base. Okay, that's what neutralization means. You're bringing the solution to a neutral value. So if you have a pH of 7.5 and you add a strong base to it, right? Well, a base increases the concentration of hydroxide ions and or decreases the concentration of hydrogen ions. So we have a solution with a pH of 7.5. If we add a strong base, the pH number is going to go up, right? Because the more basic something is, the higher the number is. So we can automatically get rid of those two. It's not going to stay at the same pH because we are adding something that is going to either decrease the hydrogen ion concentration or increase hydroxide ion concentration. So that's out. That leaves us with A and B. So we know that there's going to be an increase in the number. 
So is that because ba that base you add increases the number of hydrogen ions or because it decreases it? We just said up here, right? Decreases hydrogen ions. Um, if you increase the number of hydrogen ions in a solution, you would be adding an acid, and that would actually bring the pH number down. All right. So one of the last ideas that we're going to talk about for our basic chemistry has to do with buffers. Buffers are different than neutralizing agents. A buffer is something that allows a solution, for example, your blood, to resist changes in pH. It doesn't mean no change happens at all, but it means that the pH of the solution normalizes rapidly instead of changing permanently. And buffers, which are usually a combination of a weak acid and a, a weak base, do that by soaking up excess hydrogen and hydroxide ions. And that's what this little video shows, or this little interactive shows. Um, your respiratory system and your kidneys are in charge of your blood pH, and blood pH determines the pH of most other compartments of the body. Um, this is what happens if your body becomes too acidic. None of it is good, and it can result in death. And this is what happens if your body becomes uh, too alkaline. Um, also can end in death. So why is your body so invested in not allowing you to change your pH? Well, the sort of non-answer answer is maintaining the pH of body fluids in a narrow range is important to health. Well, that's not really an answer. Right? Um, the answer has to do with these special proteins called enzymes. Enzymes are, uh, proteins do damn near everything, but um, one of their signature jobs is making chemical reactions that are important in our cells more likely to happen. Now, when you change the pH of a solution, that contains proteins. Proteins have this complex three-dimensional shape. Remember, shape equals structure, and then structure determines function. So for this protein to work, it needs to have a particular shape. Well, the shape of proteins is profoundly sensitive to two variables. One is pH, and the other is temperature. A really high temperature can kill you because it leads to denaturation or denaturing of your enzymes. Without the enzymes, the reactions that support life don't happen, or at least they don't happen fast enough. 
So there's an optimal temperature for enzymes to function well. There's also, for every enzyme that exists, there is a specific pH where it's most effective. And if the pH is outside of that range, the protein unfolds and loses its shape and it never refolds. So if you think about, um, think about cooking an egg, if you've ever had ceviche, right? Ceviche is when you cook raw fish um, by letting it sit in um, the juice of citrus fruits, which contains citric acid. You're essentially cooking and denaturing the proteins, not with heat, but by changing the pH. And that's what makes the, um, the ceviche not just take so good, but also um, uh, have the texture and the nutritional value that it has. All right, so you're on to biochemistry. You've got the basics.